Good morning. Welcome to worship. Wow, that was loud. <laughs> Glad that you're all here. I'm delighted to see all of you here. If you happen to be a visitor, we ask members and visitors to sign the friendship registers and then pass them along so that we can see with whom we are worshiping this morning. Uh, today is a special day, of course. Every Sunday that we worship together is special, but we have our PB&J today, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We make 300 sandwiches, and they either go to the rescue mission or the Salvation Army. Where do they go today? Rescue mission today. Okay. So we will be taking them over, and if you have time after church to make those sandwiches with us, you know, many hands make light work, so we would love to have you back there. Also, there's coffee hour, so I hope you'll take the time to come back and enjoy some fellowship with the rest of the people here. Uh, this week, um, just a reminder on a couple of things, we're taking a little summer Sabbath this week. There's no trustee meeting on Tuesday evening, and there are no choir rehearsals this week. So we have a little Sabbath week from meetings, which is kind of nice. Um, also, to t let you know that the flowers, it just says happy anniversary in the bulletin. Um, it's actually from Bob Klingensmith. This is his first anniversary day without Bobby. And so we definitely want to remember him in our prayers and uh, say a thank you for the lovely flowers that we can enjoy. Also, a reminder to get the uh, Boskov passes. Uh, Brenda Tauby has them, or call the office. Uh, the shopping day is October 22nd, so you know where I'll be that day. Um, and coming up, it's going to come fast, probably, what is it, three weeks from now, September 8th, is rally day for our Sunday school, our church school. And so we're also going to have blessing of the backpacks and briefcases. So if you happen to be a working person or have little kids with backpacks, then they should come and we will have uh, a blessing for the new school year that's coming up. And also, to make that day extra special, we have lunch after church. So I think there's a sign-up sheet. I hope there is. And if not, please call the office so we know how much food to prepare. And now let us start our worship service by listening to the intro. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. O oh God, with gratitude we come to this place of worship. We have come here to be comforted after troublesome news reports and personal problems. We have come here to celebrate the joy of love and the blessing of a church family. We have come to hear your God's word to us today. How grateful we are for this sacred space. Let us worship God. And now please join us in the opening hymn, number 89, verses 1, 2, and 4.
please join me in the unison prayer printed in your bulletin. God of life, once again you have called us together for worship. We have come to be refreshed. We have come to be reminded of whose we are. We have come to explore who and how you are calling us to be in the world. God of light, in this time together, open our eyes, our hearts, and our very beings to see, hear, and feel how you are active in our midst. God of love, who calls us to live in love, May the time we spend listening for your still, small voice to awaken an awareness of how we can put love into action. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't see any little ones here today, so we will go right on to the affirmation. Join me in the affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. We believe in God, whose love for us never lets us go. We believe in Jesus Christ, whose life of love we strive to follow. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who makes God's love known to us. We believe in the church, where we gather to pray, to praise, to serve, and to try again. We believe in the grace of God, which enables us to be a people of hope, joy, service, and love. Amen. Thank you, Kim. As we come to our time of prayer, I just want to let you know of some of the concerns of our church family and friends. We are praying for Dave McCann, Ken Heck, Cynthia Mario, who is on hospice, Neil Gamble, Lexi, and her family. We're praying for Susan Lothian's daughter and grandsons after the death of her son-in-law. We're praying for Lou Crimbring. We were hoping she might be home, but she's not. She's is still in Atlantic City Medical Center, and we want to keep her spirits up. So if you want to send any cards, if you send them to the house, I know Kim will take them down to Mary Lou, and we'll be going to visit her. We're praying for Lynn Daly's stepdaughter, Pat. We're praying for Lanny Walter. We're praying for Chris, Maria, Joe. We're praying for Bob Garbett. He was hoping to be here today. He um, kind of suffered an accident getting off of a boat and kind of took a chunk out of his leg. And so we want to pray for his healing. We're praying for Nancy Swartz's grandson, Dylan, for Steve Jacoby's grandson, Kevin, Carl Ekstrom, Linda Donovan's mother Gladys, and friends Michelle and Don, Ginny Beck's friend Kathy and her stepdaughter Deborah, and Nancy Young's cousin Marilyn. Are there any other joys or concerns? Yes, Judy. I'm sure it was Howard. I'm sure they had quite an experience, too. <laughs> but we're glad things are okay. Judy, I'm sorry. We're praying for the family and friends of Haroon. Yeah. He passed away suddenly. Let's, oh yes, Barb. Okay, good. Yay, what a nice joy. Grandparenting is the best. <laughs> Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, we lift our voices in prayers of praise, for you have lifted us to new life in Jesus Christ. We come to this sanctuary, God, to praise you, to talk to you, and to listen to you. It is a place to be still and remember that you are God. Here we can leave for a little while the tragic images of war and terror, 
Here we can put aside our worries and cares and bring them to your throne of grace. We have some respite from traffic, from machines and keyboards that our lives require of us. In this sanctuary, we listen to the voices of our choir and our congregation who share the feelings so many of us have in times of grief, in periods of anxiety, and in episodes of great joy. We are with each other, and we are with you. Help us to remember that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are in the midst. We are grateful that we can hear your words to us. We can see ourselves in the pages and stories of scripture. We can gain new perspective and new insights to help us live with wisdom and courage. Give us hearts that are truly thankful this week and every day for all that you have done for us. Your saving love, your redemption in Jesus and the prospect of new life ahead of us. The, help us to be the kind of people you would have us to be. You have heard the prayers and concerns of our church family. Hear now the ones that lie deeply in our hearts. Grant us your peace. Be with us when we leave this service today. Help us to remember that you are by our side and will never leave us or forsake us. We ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. I'm sorry I didn't warn you that I wasn't going to do the Lord's Prayer until the end of the service after my sermon. So I apologize for that, for just saying a quick amen. But now let us continue our worship by presenting our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings.
Let us pray. We praise you, O oh God, for the unmeasured gifts of your grace, the countless blessings that come from your generous heart. Accept these gifts we bring as expressions of our gratitude, and accept us that we may help in your work through the power of faith, that we might praise you with our lips and glorify you with our lives. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke. And it is in this particular portion of Luke that we find Jesus teaching his disciples to pray, giving them at least part of the Lord's Prayer. There is another passage in Matthew that has another version of Jesus' prayer. That's why some churches use debts and debtors, and some churches use trespass and trespasses. As a Presbyterian minister, I have to tell you, I often said debts and debtors when I came here instead of the trespass and trespasses. But both are correct because Jesus used them both, and they obviously mean the same thing. So listen for God's word to you this morning. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, let me share a story with you. It's not like my favorite story in the world, but it's a good story. It's not a true story, but it is a truth story story. This is the legend of the touchstone. According to the legend, if you could find the touchstone on the coast of the Black Sea and hold it in your hand, anything else you touched would turn to gold. You could recognize the touchstone by its warmth. All the other stones would feel cold, but the touchstone, as you picked it up, would turn warm in your hand. Now, a long time ago, a man sold everything he had and went to the coast of the Black Sea in order to find the touchstone. He desperately wanted to find that stone. After some days passed, he realized he was probably picking up the same stone over and over without realizing it, so he came up with a plan. He decided to pick up a stone, and if it felt cold, to toss it into the Black Sea. Well, he got doing that. He did it for days and days and days, weeks and weeks. Picked up a stone, felt cold, threw it away. Picked up another stone, felt cold, threw it away. Over and over and over. Until one day, he picked up a stone, it felt warm in his hand, and he threw it away out of habit. He had that touchstone and tossed it away. He had become so dulled by the routine, he didn't recognize the stone's specialness and absentmindedly just tossed it away. Well, I think this could happen to us with the Lord's Prayer. We pick it up so often. We say it and hear it so often, every week in church. We repeat the words so often that if we're not careful, we miss the specialness, the power, the sacredness of that prayer. And before we realize what we're doing, we throw it away, toss it aside, fling it into the sea, and that is so sad. 
the Lord's Prayer is a treasure. Jesus gave it to us. The last thing we want to do is say it casually or carelessly. We don't want to routinely toss it aside because it is a sacred gift from Jesus. Remember how it was recorded in our scripture passage. The disciples came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now notice something here. When did the disciples ask for this? Was it after a great lecture about prayer that they heard Jesus tell? No. Was it after Jesus preached a powerful sermon on prayer? No, neither of those. Luke described it as Jesus was praying at a certain place. And after he had finished, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. So I think the point is clear. They saw what the prayer time meant to Jesus and what it did for him. I think they saw some amazing spiritual power released in him by prayer, and they wanted it too. So in response to their request, Jesus taught them what we call is the Lord's Prayer. What a treasure. What a gift. We can't treat something like that casually or carelessly. We can't routinely just mouth the words. It's too important for that. So let me ask you a question. As Jesus gives his disciples the Lord's Prayer, what does he teach them in that prayer? Probably a lot, but we're only going to think about a few of the things that Jesus taught them. First, Jesus teaches them to pray in a spirit of gratitude. Jesus prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Praise to thy name, or thanks be to thy name. And if you spend time with Jesus, you'll see his incredible spirit of gratitude. You can't miss it. If someone called us today and told us that we had won a Mercedes-Benz car or a Hawaii trip or $20 million, we could go on the Millionaire Lottery Dreamhouse show if we got all of that, we would probably be very excited about it. But I think it's safe to say that Jesus' enthusiasm was really about little things, ordinary, commonplace things that reveal his appreciative spirit. Remember his references to flowers, birds, mustard seeds, grass in the field, the faces of little children. In the Lord's Prayer, he's talking about bread, a piece of bread. And these are the kinds of things that we all take for granted. But all of those simple things spoke to Jesus and reminded him of the love and care of the Creator. He saw them as good and sacred gifts from the generous hand of our Heavenly Father. When you stop and think about it, you realize there is no such thing as an ungrateful Christian. That would be an oxymoron. When you're a Christian, when you're living in the spirit of Jesus, that means you live daily in a spirit of gratitude. If you looked at the quote in the bulletin today, St. Teresa of Avia gives us the greatest definition of prayer. Prayer is friendship with God. And I think if you remember that, it can change your life, or at least change the way you pray. We can talk to God like we're talking to a best friend. We can lay out our fears, our problems, our worries, our successes, our disappointments, our joys, our sorrows, our dreams, and know that God will listen to us like a best friend because he is a best friend. But I also think whatever we bring to God, we should bring in a spirit of gratitude not complaint. Jesus teaches us to pray in a spirit of gratitude. And secondly, Jesus teaches us to pray in a spirit of forgiveness. Right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, we find these words, forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus, us, Jesus is teaching us a crucial lesson about forgiveness that we desperately need to hear and understand, namely that we need to be forgiven and then we need to forgive others. Or put another way, you can't fully come into the presence of God with hatred or hostility in your heart. Jesus said it very clearly in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you come to the altar and remember that someone has something against you, go fix it. Go reconcile with them and then come back to the altar. But you might say, well, hey, wait a minute. It wasn't my fault. They did this or that or they said this or that. But as a Christian, it's your responsibility to fix it. Because the spiritual poisons of hostility, hatred, and bitterness will contaminate your spirit and mess with your soul. There's a story about Leonardo da Vinci that I really kind of like. He was painting the painting that we know is his masterpiece, The Last Supper. And he got into an argument with a fellow painter. Maybe the guy was, you know, telling him something bad about his painting and he didn't like it. I don't even know. But he was so mad at that colleague that he painted the face of Judas to look like that guy. That's mad. But then after he was finished painting that face of Judas, he was trying to paint the face of Christ. And he couldn't. He just, just could not visualize it. He couldn't, it wouldn't come to him. He just couldn't paint it. So you know what he did? He put down his paintbrush and went to find his enemy and forgive him. They both apologized and they were reconciled. And that very night, da Vinci is said to have had a dream where he saw the face of Jesus. He got up in the middle of the night and painted the face that came to him in that dream. The point, I think, is this. Leonardo da Vinci could not portray the face of Jesus with hostility in his heart, and neither can we. We come to God for our forgiveness, and then we're called to live in that generous, gracious, forgiving spirit. Lastly, Jesus teaches us to pray in a spirit of trust. Jesus put it like this in Matthew's Gospel, where the rest of the Lord's Prayer is. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Which means, O oh Lord, you are the king of life, so we will trust you and follow you. Now, I've used this story before, so forgive me if you've heard it, but I think it really says something about trust. A grandfather and his little grandson were taking a hike, walking in the woods one day. And the grandfather turned to his grandson and said, Do you know where we are right now? And the little boy said, No, Grandpa, I don't. And then the grandfather said, Well, do you know how to get back to the house from here? And the little boy said, No, Grandpa, I don't. And then the grandfather said, Well... I think you're lost. And the little boy looked up in his face and said, I can't be lost, Grandpa, because I'm with you. That is the definition of trust. I can't be lost because I'm with you. Let me ask you something. Do you trust anyone like that? Do you trust anyone that much? Do you trust God? like a little child. I think this is what Jesus had in mind when he said, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's from Matthew 18. If we could pray to God each day with that kind of childlike trust, it would make all the difference. If we could really know God as a loving, caring parent who knows what's best for us, then every prayer and every day would be entrusted to him and in doing God's work. 
One of my saintly congregants in my former church said that she prayed like this, Lord, here's what I would like. And then she would tell, you know, itemize all the things that she would like God to do. But at the end of the prayer, she said, have it your way, Lord, because you're a lot smarter than I am. Amen. Ain't that the truth? In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to pray in the spirit of gratitude, in the spirit of forgiveness, and in the spirit of trust. You know, the great thing about prayer is that it doesn't promise to get everything we want, but it does promise that we will get everything we need. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, help us not to take for granted the prayer you gave us. When we pray, help us not to say fast, meaningless words, but to have an honest conversation with our best friend. You know our needs even before we ask. So then help us to trust that you will provide everything we need. We pray in Jesus' name because he taught us how to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you'll join with me in singing our last hymn, number 333. You actually only change one word in each of the verses when you look at it. So we're just doing verse 1, 2, and 4. I hope you'll join us in coffee hour for some fellowship, and if you have time to make some of those 300 sandwiches that we take. And now may the blessing of God the Creator rest upon you and fill your hearts with thanksgiving. May the redeeming work of Jesus the Christ renew your spirits, and may the comfort and strength of God's Spirit remain with you and with all those you love today and forever. Amen.